Ashley, I'm I'm ready if we're ready. Yep, we're ready. Uh, Melanie, do you want to give the introduction? I just have to run. I just got a couple things going on here, but you can get started. Okay. Thanks, Ms. Baker. Uh, good afternoon. Um, want to just call a quick at uh, your quick attention to uh, this is Melanie Radley uh, to the screen for our new uh, applicants that are just joining us this afternoon. Um, this is just an overview of the timeline. Um, that we're prescribing to this afternoon. So I will do a five minute introduction um, and then that'll be followed by 10 minutes allowing your board um, to make introductions um, and statements. Um, then there'll be 25 minutes devoted to the full CSAB discussion followed by applicant closing statement. And then the CSAB will deliberate um, regarding um, where in the application process um, you all will move to. Um, so there'll be three options at the end, uh, advance uh, to SBE for approval, uh, application moves to second round interview or deny application. Um, just to the applicants, please be aware that there is a raised hand feature in the participant box. Otherwise, uh, we ask that um, you limit conversations um, uh, unless you're, you're asked a specific question. Um, you may also utilize the chat feature. Um, the time limits will be observed and just note um, that your resumes and CVs have been made available um, to the CSAB. Um, so you can limit um, background detail and use your introduction time um, you know, efficiently to just submit um, and speak to pertinent information just to maximize the time that we have today. So uh, without further ado, we will move to our next applicant, uh, the School of Stars at Barbara Scotia. Um, so what you see is uh, the map here for Cabarrus County. We have about 18 schools within the general six mile radius here. Uh, the proposed site being Barbara Scotia College is located on that map you'll see uh, near Concord High School. Um, but there's a listing of schools that are in the general area. Next slide, please. Okay. So again, the School of Stars at Barbara Scotia will be located in Cabarrus County in year one. Uh, their enrollment projection is for grades K through two with 198 students. Year two, K3, 264. Year three, K4, 330. Year four, K5, 396. And rounding out year five, K5 with 396. Um, Barbara Scotia, STARS at Barbara Scotia um, is slated to participate in the National School Lunch Program and the Community Eligibility Provisions in years two through five. It is unclear um, in their application what their plans are for year one, and I'm sure they'll discuss that further. Um, they will provide transportation to their student body. They will not use the weighted lottery. Um, they do have a facility um, that has been, um, they, that they have a certificate of occupancy for, um, but not specific to the education occupancy. Um, there is not an LEA impact statement on file. They are not a repeat applicant and they are not using um, the assistance of an EMO or CMO. Um, their application was complete at the time of submission. So right now I will turn it over and allow the School of Stars at Barbara Scotia for 10 minutes to complete their opening statement and introduction. Okay. Good. Good morning, everyone. I don't know what's going on. Hello? Yeah. If you try to, if um, board members, if you just have one person unmute at a time that usually makes it better if you are in the same room together someone may need to um to leave that room go to a different room so whoever wants to speak try unmuting yourself and we'll see if that helps okay this is dr Quinn. 
I'm unmuted. Are we, all, are we okay? That's better. Turn the volume down. Turn the volume down. <clears throat> that seems to be better. Yes, I think that's better. Okay. Um, good morning. Um, good, at, good evening, uh, all. My name is Dr. Jonathan Pullen, and I would like to thank you for the opportunity to present and discuss the details of our charter school application. As you were here today, our board of directors are concentrated on literacy and improving the, edu and improving the education of various subsets of students in Cabarrus County and the Logan community. Our focus is on building relationships, improving student literacy, encouraging parental involvement, managing financial compliance, and securing a long-term partnership with Barbara Scotia College and Black Child Development, Inc. The Board of Directors will now introduce themselves, beginning with Ms. Barnes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is, My name is Maria Barnes, Barnes, and I'm an early childhood educator with a focus on literacy development for pre-K through second grade. Good afternoon. My name is Rose Jones Edwards. Uh, I'm on the executive committee as the secretary. Uh, my profession of being an entrepreneur and I will be responsible for the area of governance. Good afternoon, board. My name is Ophelia Fredette. I am the uh, L coordinator for um, our school. Dr. Pullen, would you like to continue with your opening statement? Is there, you still have time? Hello. Hi. Hi, I am Rashima Norris, and my current position with the School of Stars at Barbara Scotia College is Vice Chair. I am a pre-K teacher and have been teaching pre-K for over 20 years in the public and private sector. Good afternoon. No. I am Ella Mason. Good afternoon. I'm Ella Mason. I am Ella May Snow, a retired educator and a member of the Concord City Council. I taught in public school for 42 years with the elementary grades and with the second children. And this is my 14th year on the Concord City Council. And I'm responsible for the compelling need for a charter school. Good morning. My name is Avis J. Clark. I'm here with the School of Stars at Barbara Scotia College. I'm also the president of the Logan Community Association. Good afternoon. My name is Jacqueline Long. I have a master's in special education and I will be responsible for the exceptional children portion of this interview. Good afternoon. I'm Devanya Govan Hunt. I am coming to you as a president for the Black Child Development Institute, Charlotte Affiliate, and the founder and CEO of Govan Hunt Staff Development, LLC. 
And I'm going to introduce Dr. Douglas of Barbara Scotia College next. Thank you. Hi again. Uh, my name is Dr. Mel Douglas. I'm the a president of Barbara Scotia College. I have 27 years in the field of elementary and secondary schools, and of course, a whole lot of years on the college level. Uh, thank you for this consideration. Good afternoon, my name is Mercedes Pullen. My background and areas of expertise are in public health, healthcare administration, and business management. I will answer questions related to the meal plan in conjunction with Dr. Pullen. Okay, we're finished, Ashley. Okay, thank you. Um, then Alex, are you back? Yeah. All right, well, this begins up oh, there, Alex. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Uh, we're just getting a wicked echo here. Um, so I, just if, if the Barbara Scotia or whoever on the call, if it's, if it's board uh, CSAB members, we can just make sure you're muted. Uh, it'll ensure a smooth facilitation of this interview. Great. So at this point, we're going to open it up for questions and discussion. And uh, those of uh, the folks who are on the CSAB who uh, read this application in depth, I'd love to hear um, what questions that you have uh, today. And if you, know, just a you know, if you could just jump in, why don't we do this? Um, I know that many of you already probably have questions that you've thought of, so um, I'll go ahead and just open it up. Um, who would like to start us off? Uh, this is this is Bruce Brand, I guess. Then I'll be next. So Bruce, then Hilda. Yes. Great. Thank you. So a few questions I had was one was clarification on the enrollment. Uh, if you look in throughout the application and supporting documents, it says A five, but uh, unless I'm misreading it, at the very first part of the application under the enrollment projections, it shows K-4. So just clarification on that. Um, at some point, maybe they could speak to um, the education plan, specifically uh, the English language arts curriculum. Um, it looks like they're using Envision Math, if I remember correctly, but it really, I don't think it spelled out what the English language, language arts curriculum was gonna be. Um, no, it did, it was uh, the EL curriculum. Oh, okay. Thank you for that. Um, and, uh, and then just, uh, so I'm assuming, uh, understanding correctly, that Mr. Poole and Dr. Poole will be that he's on the board now, but then would be stepping off to become the executive director of the, of the school. Yeah, and just building off that question, Bruce, I wanted to know how many of the board members currently would, would be working for the school? Because I heard a couple people say, I'll manage EC, I'll manage EL. So why don't we start with your question about the um, just what is the enrollment uh, structure and then could you clarify the board's roles when the school opens? Okay. Um, the first year we're opening K through two, um, we will have 66 students per grade level. So kindergarten will have three classes with 22 students each for a total of 66. First and second grades will uh, replicate that. And then each year, two through four, we're going to add an additional 66 students and we'll level off in year four and year five, uh, we won't uh, add any additional students. Um, so the first year will be 198 students. Um, at the end will be uh, 396. 
um, in terms of board members that will be uh, interactive with the school. Hopefully, we're 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 trying to hire as many as we can. They everyone has a current job, um, so we have to be sensitive to that. But certainly. Um, um, our, our lead uh, on our curriculum, Ms. Barnes, um, Ms. Long for our um, EC, and then again, um, Ms. Tilly um, with our ELL. Uh, in terms of BCDI, they will be embedded within the school, so we actually have a place for them um, for the entire school year to work with our parents and to support um, student literacy. Okay, so just to clarify again, how many total board members do you have right now? We have 12 right now. Okay, and how many are here for the meeting? We have nine that are here. Um, we uh, had, I got a call this morning from our treasurer. Uh, he's bedridden and, and can't make it. We have another board member because we are in a confined space who had some current concerns about COVID-19. Uh, Ms. Jones, so she's, uh, she's in. Um, one of our financial advisors, uh, Mr. Fisher, um, he resigned from the board. Um, he was already the chair of three other boards. Um, plus, he's got kids and grandkids, but he said that he would remain as a financial advisor and um, once we're chartered, he will uh, take over the uh, process of applying for 501c3. Okay, so four board members are going to potentially work for the school? Yes, if we can, in their specialty areas, which we'll be responding to today. Okay, Bruce, do you, did you do you have any follow-ups to that? Well, I, I guess just a clarification then that those board members would then be stepping off the board if they're actually going to work for the school, correct? That's absolutely correct, and I will step off myself um, once we're chartered and become the uh, ED. Okay. Alex, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, can you tell me exactly what this nonprofit is going to do, and is the school paying the nonprofit? Oh, yes, okay. Um, I will let uh, Dr. Gordon handle that. Thank you for that question. Um, the National Black Child Development Institute Charlotte Affiliate actually focuses on parent engagement. Um, from a multi-pronged aspect. And through that parent engagement, we have literacy as a focus. So we will be supporting the School of Stars through making sure that their parents have appropriate uh, materials and opportunities for engagement with the school and the educators, as well as the community. We are a nonprofit. We are one of 28 national affiliates across the country, and we charge absolutely nothing for our services. So we will be providing culturally relevant and responsive literature to the children that attend the School of Stars, as well as their families, as well as opportunities for their families to engage in opportunities that look at health and wellness um, policy issues as well, in terms of making sure that their children have adequate opportunities once they graduate from the School of Stars, and also providing um, professional development opportunities for the teachers or for the staff, the administrative team of the School of Stars at absolutely no cost. So this is not an employment, this is a partnership. Okay, uh, Mercedes Pullen is related to Dr. Pullen in which way? I'm back, I'm back my father. And okay. will, you, will you be staying on the board? Once your dad is employed, will you be staying on the board? No, I will not. So if this is Ms. Reeves, if, if I'm understanding or hearing this correctly, um, currently on the chart, it looks like nine members or 10, 10 members on the board who are active. Uh, five will not be on the board once the school starts. Thank you. 
potentially, potentially, if we can negotiate, um, if we can negotiate, we're actually lucky, lucky to find and you know, participate on our board. So if we can, um, we will definitely bring them on board, which means that we will have to, uh, you know, recruit additional board members. We have uh, a lot of people in the community that really wanted to serve on this board. Um, but we recruited from specialty areas. And so we do have um, a bench of potential board members. Dr. Pullen, this is Ms. Reeves. How many um, board members does your bylaw state that you will have? A minimum of seven and a maximum of eleven. This is uh, Jeanette Butterworth. And I have a question really for um, you all that would like to kind of to weigh in. Um, as I look at your mission statement, which is to improve your skills of K-5 students using curricula and one-to-one -one technology as tools to accomplish SMART goals, um, I, that leaves me wanting a little more description about the, the learning environment. So if I'm a if I'm a potential parent looking at the school, what is it that I would see to the to a classroom? What is it that would compel me to want to involve my child in school? And I, I saw a lot of those things and written in the application, but I would, I'd like to hear y'all describe um, what it's going to look like. And then also in there, I'm curious about the relationship um, with the college. So could you know that you're done? Could you please repeat that question? Because I was getting a lot of interference on my end, and I did not hear you clearly. And I want to make sure that I heard you, um, that I can answer that question precisely before I answer it. So could you please repeat your question? Sure. Can you hear me okay now? Um, yes. Okay. So I read the mission statement, which I feel is a, a fairly general mission statement. And it, it left me wanting more information about what it's going to be, what's the learning environment going to be like in the school. And I read a lot of the things in the application programs. Um, but I was wondering if, if y'all could describe to me what, it, what I'm going to see, what I'm going to hear. What it's going to be like walking into that school. So if I'm a parent, what's going to tell me to want want to engage? And then also curious about um, the relationship with the college. Sure. I think I got the gist of your question. If I left off something, please forgive me. So when you um, when you ask about the learning environment. As a parent, if you were to walk in TSOS and walk into any classroom, you will see students involved. You will see students with smiles on their faces. You will see productive struggle because we want our students to experience productive struggle so they can be successful in what they are learning and their learning opportunities that, um, that they see fit. Um, the engagement with their children, they are going to be engaged with each other. Teachers are going to be facilitating that learning. And when I say engage with each other, they are going to be using higher order thinking skills or higher order language to communicate with each other. Um, also, the relationship with the college, we will have staff that will be able to come that if that will be employed with Barbara Fosha that will come over to um, the School of Stars and collaborate with our with our staff or the School of Stars to exchange that to exchange that one on one or that expertise that we will need for the School of Stars. So the student will constantly see excellence at all times while they are on campus. Mr. Quigley, can yes, I take a question? question. Uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, one of the one of the things that's exciting me about the School of Stars, and one of the reasons why I agreed 
uh, for the School of Stars to be housed here was that uh, Dr. A poem and his philosophy is in, in alignment with what I want to do with college. I've been here I've been for here about uh, uh, a one and a half years, years now. now. And my goal is to bring Barbara Scope to college, uh, not where it was, but beyond that, in terms of academic uh, excellence, as well as its engagement with the community. This is an excellent opportunity for, uh, for us. We also have in our curriculum a college for parents. And what that means is that parents who have youngsters in school, particularly at, in the School of Stars, will be able to come on the weekends uh, a couple of times, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a few hours a week, and they'll be able to chew and chat. And uh, what that means is that they're able to come here and have a breakfast on the Saturday and talk about some of the innovative things that we're doing, not only at Barbara Scotia to help children be better learners, uh, but also to talk to the faculty, uh, not only at Barbara Scotia, but at the School of Stars. Uh, that way there'll be a linkage. Uh, they can take some non-accredited classes in uh, child psychology and, um, and, and in the latest teaching strategies in order to help students be better learners. So uh, we're excited and uh, we can't wait to get our, our, uh, our selves involved on a much higher level. The other thing is that we have excellent facilities here. Uh, these youngsters, we have a huge gym. We have a huge yard that they can play in. The facility that they'll be housed in is a contemporary facility. It's a rather large you know, facility. In fact, it's the largest on campus. And we have a beautiful auditorium. Um, and uh, we have a lot of eating space, if, if you will. Uh, our, our, uh, our, cafe, cafe, ca I'm sorry, our cafeteria is so large that the local folks around here at the hotels like to use it for banquets. So there's a lot of good things that we have. We have a modern kitchen, very big, in fact, better than some restaurants around here. So uh, we're with the WIC site, and we have an elevator so that the youngsters can go from one floor to the other um, in the world without any a problem. And it's a lot of light, a lot of light. So uh, again, we are we are excited about working with the School of Stars and uh, and the community at large. Thank you very much. So just to follow up on that, um, could help us understand. You kind of painted a picture where the the students are going to kind of have access to the whole college. How is how is that going to work? Where this. You know, are they going to be eating in the cafeteria with college kids? What does that What does that actually look like? No, 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 no. no. They will they not, not be eating in the cafeteria. They will not be eating in the cafeteria. We have a huge cafeteria, but we also have a cafeteria. It's muted now. Can you hear me? Yeah. No. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, and we have time for the students to eat. In other words, at Barbara's program, it is not, you know, don't go into the large cafe, cafe. I'm having a problem with the word cafeteria today. Uh, uh, anytime you want. There's a smaller one for students who are, who are college students that they can access that. Plug downstairs. Uh, we have what we call the Sabre Den, and that's a beautiful facility where the students hang out. Uh, we have a full a kitchen down there where they can get salads and, and hamburgers, hot dogs, and there's a music uh, a space there. So there's nothing room. How many students are on campus, and how will you keep the uh, keep elementary students separate from college students? Well, for one thing, the students do not have classes there. Uh, we have enough room on our uh, campus where, where the college students will, will be taking classes someplace else. Okay, we have a couple um, 
We can probably circle oh, back. Oh, to I'm sorry. I'm minutes. sorry. You asked how many students do, do we have? Presently, the students are online because of the COVID. Okay. How many um, students do you have? Excuse me? How many students do you have? Are they're online. Okay, oh, how many do you have? 150. How many students at the at the college at this current time? None are in. None are on the college physically. Well, I'm saying if COVID college. wasn't happening, how many would you have? 150. Okay. And in terms of have have you for things like kindergarten, you know the the model calls for kindergarten. There's a whole lot of requirements that. Uh, that would need to, you know, you'd essentially have to renovate, fully renovate classrooms. You have to have a bathroom. You have to have an egress to the outside. Have, have you considered that? Yes, I have, because I have a degree in early childhood education. So I, and, and I've worked as a daycare center director at a preschool. So I know all about that. Yes, I do. And, I, and we've made, and, and we've made a comma Adations for those students to be here. And to piggyback off of that, Alex, that was a good question that you asked. Thank you for asking that. Um, we will have money in the budget for renovations, and we have already looked at those renovations and considered those renovations that we will have to do to the building for those early childhood class with, for those early childhood classrooms, such as kindergarten. So thank you for asking that question. Okay, we have a couple of Ed Plan questions. I want to. Heather, I believe, has an EdPad plan question, then Rita, I think you have a question. Uh, hi, it's Heather Van Cannon. Um, I wanted to ask about the alignment of project-based learning, which is uh, seen throughout your um, proposed application. And um, let me turn down Blue's Clues here real quick. Um, so I, I want to make sure that um, with prescribed curricula, between EL and also Envision, um, that that's something that's going to work. Can someone speak to that, please? Hi, Heather. Yes. Um, to answer your question, it will work because L, the L curriculum itself is based off of project-based learning. Um, so when you dig deeper into the curriculum, the curriculum itself lends to project-based learning. Everything around or centered around the curriculum has different projects that the children will be working on in collaboration with um, language development and other skills that they will need. So the L curriculum itself is based off of project learning um, background off of project learning collaboration. So that will be incorporated within L and Envision. Just to follow up on the on the on the EL curriculum, um, you you said you did research on on that curriculum. What what led you to it? What led me to the research was one: we wanted to find a curriculum that was language based that we could use that would develop language and vocabulary within early learning, early literacy or early learners. We wanted to reach those early learners first and have that foundation solid with them. So that's what led me to the research behind the L curriculum, because when you start looking at the L curriculum, that's one of the things that they that they pride themselves on or they're known for. They're known for setting that solid foundation early for early early literacy. So by the time the children get to third grade, they will have that solid language foundation. It will also help with the reading success pathways that will get them ready for third grade as well.
Okay, great. So we have some follow-ups. I've got a few um, folks. Uh, let's, I'm gonna, this is what I wanna do. Um, Uh, Heather, do you want to, or so one one follow up to that question was, Sherry said, uh, you know, if PBL is is so important, why is it not mentioned in the mission and vision? Could you comment on that? I can answer that, Alex. And uh, it's very simply um, when I was putting together the mission statement and the vision for the school. Um, it was just something that we um, just did not think about consulting with Ms. Barnes about. Um, we were just focused on our technology and literacy and things of that nature. So it was an oversight on my part. I take full responsibility for that. Okay. Um, so otherwise you would have had that in the in the budget okay um so we have a we are in the uh in the mission statement we have a couple i'm just trying to there's a bunch of chat questions coming in. i'm trying to manage here um let's let's get into the budget quickly um i'm gonna hand it over to lynn and then uh hilda you can kind of follow up because your question is connected to around the assistance we can kind of take it from there go ahead lynn this is Lynn Kroger, and I just had some questions around the budget. Um, I noticed that in years two through five, you have other revenue budgeted, and I just was curious what that was related to. Um, yes, that was the, uh, I call it the pass-through um, budget f um, for um, lunch, um, free and reduced lunch. We just put that in a budget, pass it through as other as other revenue. So you have an offsetting expense then for child nutrition? Get to that I'm not sure I understand how that's going to be And then I guess some of my other questions related to the budget too is I know you had said that you were going to do map testing, um, but I don't see where that's budgeted for. And if you could point out where the renovations money is also um, and explain, but maybe I need to understand how the relationship is with the college, because again, like utilities does not seem near enough money to be budgeted. So is there like, are you sharing the cost of utilities or are you paying those outright? And then are the classrooms furnished because again, $7,500 for classroom furniture and fixture does not seem um, near enough to outfit classrooms with furniture. Yes, um, here's, I'm um, Dr. Douglas again. Uh, yes, we are sharing some of the expenses. As I stated before, uh, we are very happy to have them here to serve not only the community, uh, but to uh, uh, be an extra part of the college experience. Um, the classrooms are furnished, and, and in fact, we have, and the offices are furnished too. Uh, so uh, there, those expenses uh, will not be incurred in the same way in which uh, they would be if the if the classrooms were not adequate, adequately uh, furnished. So, is it furnished with um, desks and seats for young children? Yes. Okay. Why is it furnished with desks and seats for young children? Because we had, <laughs> I don't know if you know the history of the college, but we had a, what we call a kitty college here for many, many years. Uh, so uh, when the school, the, when the school went through its transition, what we did is just, we just stored it away. Lynn, did you have another question? Well, also, as far as busing, two buses don't seem like enough for, you know, 200 students. Um, and the map testing, I don't think you addressed the question about map testing or even the renovations. If you could point that out also where that's at in the budget. Okay. Um, let me start um, with the renovations. The um, 
the school does not need a lot of renovations. Matter of fact, it, it really doesn't need any. Um, what we will do is put in some T15 lighting. Uh, the roof is secure, HVAC is working, um, no leaking. Uh, the floors are in perfect condition. They just, um, the, no broken windows. Um, so our renovation budget, uh, I believe is around $5,000 year one. It's not, it's really not that much. We'll cut some trees and do some things like that. But the college manages uh, uh, the maintenance, uh, the yard, so we don't even have to do that. It's a great partnership. The building's in, in, in actual great shape. We considered going fast track because the, because the facility is ready. It's ready to go. Um, you had another question. Uh, I, just, I, gotta, I, gotta, I just wanna jump in there because that contradicts what we- I can't remember. That we had a, we asked earlier about the, the readiness of the classrooms for kindergarten and yeah, we were yeah. we were told that you're aware of the renovations in there that was appropriately budgeted. I mean, you could not renovate a classroom and put an install a bathroom for five thousand dollars. The uh, the building's ready. It's it's ready for us uh, to occupy. We've got the classrooms and the, everything set up. It's in perfect condition for us. So the kindergarten classrooms have bathrooms in them already. Well, well, because we're only going to have three kindergarten classrooms, the configuration of the building is we'll, pay, we'll place the classrooms where the bathrooms are. So the building, the building is, um, it's wide open for our usage. So we already know, for instance, where the three kindergarten classrooms are going to go because they're going to be located right there at the bathrooms. Just right there. So okay. I don't think that's a yeah. no, that there's not a bathroom inside the classroom. I think that's a requirement, isn't it? Um, I don't think so. I, it, yes. I know you want to have um, kindergarten, um, have bathroom. It's it's right there at the bathroom, though. There is, it's, it's right, they don't even have to walk down the hall. It's like right adjacent. It's just right there. Uh, it, it, it may depend on, on uh, Sherry on the um, if they would be able to be if kind of folded in under pre-existing code, but there's a strong likelihood for them to get a certificate of occupancy that they would need. They could require them to in, install egress door exterior doors and in kinder bathrooms in the in the classroom. Okay, so um, okay. let's see, Hilda. Uh, I want to get you in here. You had a couple questions. Um, I'm sorry, Alex. Yes. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. This is um, yeah. this is Dr. Govan Hunt. Uh, in regards to the restrooms for the kindergarten classrooms, as Dr. Pullen pointed out, the kindergarten classrooms will be held in classrooms that were previously used for the Kitty College. So there's not even a, a huge threshold for where those children will actually have to cross over to get into those restrooms. It literally is right there. There's a door entry between the classroom and the restroom. They're not going down the hall. They're in sight the entire time. So the question was, are there bathrooms in the classrooms? The answer would be yes, because there's not a complete separation between where the children will be learning, their learning environment, and where the restrooms are other than a door, a threshold. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't know the code in that in, in the well, city, but it sounds like it, it might be sufficient. I don't know if they would require you to have egress doors either. So I, I'm just saying that it, it, it could be an issue. Um, you know, they, they can be maniacal about some of this stuff. Um, okay, so Hilda, you had a question? Yes, I have several here. Okay, thank you, Alex. Back to the enrollment trends. How will the wheelchair visits be face to face with families? Should COVID still exist? Give us an update on how you intend to change that process. And which community groups are you currently receiving funds, as you mentioned in your application, and how much? I'll let you answer those two, and then I'll be back. Thank you. Um, for the community funds, um, we haven't received any commitments. We have organizations 
that we plan to market with and get commitments, but nobody has made a financial commitment to the school yet. Um, but we're looking at organizations such as the Panthers, uh, NASCAR. Um, I plan to um, move my Rotary Club membership to Cabarrus County and be involved with the business community. Um, as well, we will try to um, link up with uh, Barbara Scotia on some fundraising events. Um, and, uh, and banks, of course, uh, local banks in Charlotte. I have some relationships there. Um, so um, that's the answer to that question. And that other question was regarding home visits. Home visits. In person visits. Yeah, so uh, that's a great question because even with the promise of a vaccination, we know we still got a long way to go, right? Um, so BCDI Charlotte is committed to working with the School of Stars and their teachers on how to conduct home visits in a safe manner, following all the recommendations of the CDC, um, using a manner which we call a curbside visit, which is something that we perfected over the last year and was able to reach over 900 families actually using this method just during the summer months. So a curbside visit or a front porch visit would be where our teachers would be um, conducting those visits right there on the front porch at the doorstep. For those individuals who needed more in-depth service than that or needed to gather more information, then those would be um, considered a part of the hybrid process and that would be virtual. Unfortunately, we can't control COVID, right? But um, mm -hmm. if we take those measures, we definitely will be able to reach our families because it's been proven to work over the past few months. Well, thank you. That's very good to know. And why are there no assistance in grade two? Budget. That was a budgetary, Ms. Hilda, on my part. Um, we wanted to have um, TAs in every grade level. Mm -hmm. um, we, I just decided to focus in on kindergarten first, hire some really strong second grade teachers, and then put those TAs back starting um, year two when we begin to take the EOGs. All righty, thank you. And why is technology only going to be used in math, mathematics, and ELA? Uh, I the other the courses. courses. It's going to be used in all of our, um, all of our course. Ms. Vaughn, do you want to add Technology will be used throughout the day, and the children will be able to take technology home as well. Um, but technology will be used across disciplines every day. That's good to know. And uh, the lease mentions that the school and the landlord will be responsible for electricity. Explain why the tenant, you, would also be uh, responsible for electrical bills. Um, it's part of our lease. Um, it, it was a uh, negotiation. Um, thankfully, um, they're going to share the cost um, because we'll be burning, you know, quite a bit of electricity um, on a daily basis. So we we just thought it was just um, fair and good business as part of our lease to share that cost with you. And Dr. Douglas, you can jump in if you'd like. All righty, thank you. And one more question. Uh, as I said, uh, the uh, building that they're gonna be using is a very a very large building. And how, how, however, uh, there will be some space in which the college will be using. Uh, for example, on weekends, uh, we may be having certain kinds of e events in the in the uh, uh, the dining area. As I said again, it's a very big space, and we use that sometimes for uh, uh, weddings, and uh, we you know we use it for home coming, uh, dinners, and stuff like that. So uh, we just thought that it would be it would be uh, in good keeping and good spirit uh, for us to take that route. All righty, thank you very much. And one last one, you mentioned that students with special needs will have access to Uber, Lyft, and or taxis. Now suppose I do not have a child who has special needs and would just love for my children uh, to take Uber or Lyft or a taxi. How would you make, how will you make sure that the kids with special needs will only use those sources of transportation. Uh, Ms. Long, um, uh, this is Ms. Long. I'll be answering that question. I didn't quite hear you the first time. Could you repeat that question, please? Um, I apologize. 
Oh, no problem. You mentioned that kids with special needs will have access to Uber, Lyft, or taxes. Suppose I'm a parent and I do not have a kid who has special needs, but would love for my child to go to school uh, using Uber, Lyft, or a taxi. How would you enforce or ensure that only the kids with special needs will have those opportunities only? Um, I would, uh, we would probably have um, um, forms that the students would fill out prior to um, prior to being admitted to the school. Um, if that form indicates that their student um, is a special needs student, that um, those students will be the ones using those facilities and that type of special transportation. Um, um, we will um, make sure that um, those uh, students will, um, and the st um, students that do not have that um, indicated on their application um, will not be allowed to um, participate in writing in those special transportation. And those parents will also, um, the School of Stars parents will also be educated on who is, um, will be able to use those type of transportation um, back and forth to school. They will be educated on that so they will know if your child needs these type, this type of transportation, they will already know the qualifications for that up front. Um, I'm going to just ask for a time check, Ashley. Thank you. Ashley, do you know We're where we are? Or, uh... We're 14 minutes over. Okay. That's what I, or Melanie. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's what I thought. Okay. So I'm going to, um, we're going to, we'll give the school an opportunity to make a closing statement and then we'll close discussion, uh, close Q and A for now. Okay. Okay. Uh, the Board of Directors of the School of Stars at Barbara Scotia College sincerely appreciates the opportunity to answer your questions and share our mission for the students in Cabarrus County and the Logan community. We want to thank Dr. Melvin Douglas of Barbara Scotia College uh, for providing us with guidance uh, facilities at affordable rates and a long-term business relationship. As stated in our opening statement, uh, we will focus uh, on building business relationships, improving student literacy, improving parental involvement, managing financial compliance, and securing a long time, I'm sorry, a long term uh, partnership with Barbara Scotia College and Black Child Development Inc. Thank you again, CSAB, for your time and consideration of our application. Okay, and so at this time we're going to close uh, discussion with the with the uh, stars board. And so at this time, uh, just as a reminder, you're you're not permitted to to speak unless we ask a question. Um, and we're just I'm going to open it for discussion at the board level. Um, who would like to start us off? All right, Alex. This is Joel Ford. I um, go ahead. Joel. I've been listening. Thank you. I've been listening and I've read the application. I'm very familiar with um, Barbara Scotia College and in its own challenges, right? So I like the idea and I wanna be supportive, but I've got so many questions as it relates to the facilities there um, and how the students would be separated uh, in the future post pandemic and how the college students would be able to, because having schools and college campuses in state of North Carolina is not new. I just think that for me, um, I need greater clarity on a facilities plan as to how the students will use what facilities, when and where, and then when the college students do come back, what they will be using. And then secondarily, you know, the budget, there are some questions there that I need to wrap my mind around as it relates to um, 
how they will be able to successfully operate the school and then do it in a sustainable manner. But in terms of a concept, Mr. Chairman, uh, in terms of location, in terms of the, the needs of the students for choice in that area, I am aware of them and I know that they need it. I just need to make sure that the charter school can be successful on that campus given uh, the many challenges that the current college is experiencing and has. I, I am aware that they do have new leadership there and that the president is working very, very hard. I just want to, you know, make sure that they can coexist and, and both can do it successfully. All right, other comments? Chair, this is Rita Hare speaking. Um, I agree with Joel Ford. I, I, want, I love the concept and want to see the success of a school meeting these types of needs, uh, but I have a number of concerns that I don't know could be answered uh, this quickly or that there are answers yet. It, it just feels like there needs to be more time. In the short term, the year one meal plan concerns me uh, with a budget of about $2.20 a child. Uh, for the first year, I just don't know how that will be managed. I know they talk about free food and some other things, but it's just it's very um, conceptual right now. Um, I, wanted to, I wondered about uh, Dr. Govan Hunt. I know that she runs a nonprofit. I did have a question. She also operates a business. I don't think there was ever clarity there, but I wanted to hear that develop. I know the board members are fluctuating and there will be shifting and changing, but currently we don't have any uh, background checks on any of the board members. And um, that may seem like a technicality and it, and it kind of is, but it's part of the documentation that we collect and it would be an important submission uh, if the school were to go forward. Thank you. Other comments? Chairman Quigley, this is Lynn Kroger. Um, yeah, I agree with um, Mr. Ford. This is definitely a high need area and we need um, charter schools in this area. I am concerned, however, because it is a smaller school and being able to support that budget, um, I would like to see more confidence in uh, the board understanding the budget and making sure that all the line items are accounted for. And um, I just also just understand how that facility is going to work with college kids on that campus as well and making sure that the kids are kept separate. It would be very interesting to see how that um, is going to be handled. I'm, I'm, I'm going to jump in here and just say that, you know, I, I, do, I think it's an innovative idea. Um, I don't feel like it's ready for prime time. And uh, I don't I don't see the gaps that I'm, I'm seeing. Um, able to be uh, bridged between now and next month. And, and I think this, you know, I'd like to see that this team work on this and really flesh things out uh, and come back to us next year with, with a more cohesive plan. So that's the, I'm not going to support the application moving forward, um, but that's just want to go ahead and put my thoughts out. Alex, this is Cheryl, and I was going to say what you just said. And I agree with you too, Tilda Perley. Um, Mr. Quigley, this is Ms. Reeves. I was very concerned um, when I was reading the application um, because of the number of folks that I thought would probably be um, hands on with the school, basically on payroll with the school. And then in the meeting, it was fleshed out that about six members will go off the board. Um, we've seen this in the past with family board members when they don't stick around their school doesn't succeed um that's just one of my major concerns i have concerns about the mission and plan the budget um i i really don't i i do agree that this would be an awesome opportunity to partner with barbara scotia college um i know that they're on uh, have fallen on hard times um, and this would be a great opportunity for the Logan community and the children in that area, but this is certainly not ready in my opinion. I would like to make a motion that we do not move um, the School of Stars at Barbara Scotia Ford at this time. This is Lynn Kroger. I second that. Properly moved and seconded in discussion on the motion. Yes, uh, this is Joel Ford again. Uh, I know the board members um, and the president of the college are listening. And so I want to be clear that this is a worthy idea. 
and I do understand that there's a sense of urgency for the charter school, for the college and the community. However, I think what we're trying to say here, and, and let me speak for myself, we want to position the charter school for success. We want to make sure that the charter school can be able to sustain that success. And so there's some open questions. There are some, some issues and some challenges that we believe or that, that I believe need to be bridged in order for that success to happen. So I'm hoping that you uh, guys will stick around and stay and then come back. But uh, I'm going to unfortunately have to support this motion at this time. Any further discussion on the motion? Hearing none, I'll call for a roll, roll call vote. All right. Jeanette Butterworth? Aye. Joel Ford? Aye. Bruce Brent? Aye. Rita Hare? Aye. Lynn Kroger? Aye. Hilda Parley? Aye. Alex Quigley? Aye. Sherry Reeves? Aye. Cheryl Turner? Aye. Heather Van Cannon? And it might have gone off, but it has passed unanimously. All right, thank you. We hope to see you again in the future. All right. At this time, we're transitioning into the uh, F. All right, Mr. Uh, Zaycor, are you on the phone? I am. I'm All right, how are you, Tom? So happy to be here, you know, after lunch at the end of the meeting, you know, just ready to get everyone really interested in public records and open meetings and ethics. All right, let me pull your presentation up. That's the money slot. It's the, that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you always like to speak after lunch, you know. Uh, Let's see. Okay. All right, you are up. All right, so uh, today uh, we're going to go over three things uh, public records, open meetings, and board member conduct, or hopefully ethical conduct. Uh, and we're going to cover a lot of material quickly. And you'll need to pay close attention because at the end there's going to be a test that you must pass in order to get credit for this course. And I've been involved with advising people and fighting over public records and open meetings and some ethics issues for about 30 years. And from my personal experience and study, I can tell you that the laws applicable to public records and open meetings are extremely complex. Uh, in fact, I've taken cases to the Court of Appeals on these issues and lost them, which only goes to show that the Court of Appeals can be wrong so many times. Uh, but the fact that there's a lot of real law in here uh, doesn't mean you have to know it all. What you need to know, you need to have a rule of thumb so when you get in a situation that requires you to make a decision, you'll have an idea of what to do. So. Back in the early days of Saturday Night Live, there was a comedian named Don Novella who played a character named Father Guido Sarducci. And Father Sarducci was an Italian priest who, with a heavy Italian accent, offered his insights into modern life from a, a slightly skewed Italian Catholic perspective. And one of my favorite bits of Father Guido Sarducci was the five-minute university. And a five-minute university was a university that in five minutes, that for $20, would teach you everything you would remember about your college five years after you graduated. So the $20 included the cap and gown. It, called, it included a 20-second spring break with orange juice and a sun lamp and a graduation photo. But in that five minutes at, the, at Father Guido Sarducci's university, you'd learn everything you would know about economics five years after you graduate from college. Well, everything you knew about economics five years after graduation was supply and demand. 
If you were a business major, you learned buy low, sell high. If you studied religion, you found out where God was. God is everywhere. And if you went to law school, you learned that ignorance was no excuse. So today we're going to go over a bunch of public records and open meeting stuff, but you're not going to need to remember most of it because, frankly, you do not have to deal with the details. That's why they pay Ashley and me and a bunch of your other lawyers the big bucks. Uh, so what you'll need to know is the five-minute university part. So at the beginning and the end, I'm going to tell you what the five-minute university part is about all of these issues. So if you actually go to the public record slide of the 132, move up. You're gone too far. You're going too fast for me. Going too fast. Public records. What do you need to know about public records in five minute universe? You need to know that everything is a public record. Everything is a public record. That's all you need to know and you need to act accordingly. So every time you do something, every time you type something, every time you leave a recording, every time you take a note about charter schools, that is a public record. So now, what are the details of it? The this, this slide shows you more of the details. But as we move into more and more electronic communications, you know, the idea that you actually have documents and maps and books and photographs is passe. What you have is electronic data. And all your electronic data is public record. Uh, and it doesn't, and as you see on the slide, it doesn't matter what the physical form is. The fact that it's a record, it records something, it retains something. Something Someone told me a long time ago that the only reason to write something down is so someone else can read it. If someone else can read or recover what you were thinking, then it's a public record. And you need to act accordingly. Now, it needs to be made or received in connection with the transaction of public business. But generally speaking, if you're engaged in charter schools and you're doing work as a charter school board member, it's made or received in connection with the transaction of public business. The transaction of public business doesn't mean signing a contract or doing anything formal. It just means doing your job as a member of the board. So what's the public record? Everything's a public record. And everything you do is a public record, and that's all you need to know. So go to the next slide. Uh, so your emails, the attachments to your emails, your text messages, they're all public records. Your policies, directives, correspondence, work schedules, meeting agendas, minutes, everything is a public record, including including your drafts of your documents. There was a famous North Carolina case about the Pool Commission, the News and Observer versus Pool. It was an investigation of sporting mis misconduct at NC State. Some of you might be old enough to remember it. It was when Jimmy Valvano was there. And the Pool Commission was investigating it using the SBI. And the NFL wanted to see the drafts of the report. And it went all the way to the North Carolina Supreme Court. And the North Carolina Supreme Court said, there is no exception in the Public Records Act for drafts. There's nothing that says that only the final document is a public record. So drafts, everything you write. Now, when the Pool Commission report was, was the subject of the Supreme Court decision, text messaging had not been invented yet. But text messaging is a public record. Anything that's recorded that can be recovered by someone else to find out what you were thinking is a public record, if it's done in the course of public business. So when you're sitting at a meeting like this, and you're texting other people on the board about Tom Zyko and his presentation, that is a public record. All right, go on to the next slide. Again, there's a lot of detail here. Written communications from an attorney to a public board are not public records. Those are attorney-client privilege, but 
you got to remember that communications from you to the attorney are a public record. So if the chair writes to me and asks for an opinion about some charter school thing, that request is a public record. My response to the request is attorney-client privilege, but the request is not. The request is a public record. Tax records, trade secrets, it says if properly submitted, what that means is that it has to be identified as a trade secret when it's given to you. Uh, other things are not public records, but this whole slide and these details are not for you to worry about. These are for the attorneys and the staff to worry about. You have to be thinking that everything you do is a public record. All right, next slide. Of course, we have major exceptions in education for student records. Uh, and FERPA protects all student records, and we do not uh, release student records. Uh, other things that is that are not included, uh, certain personnel information, not all personnel information, but certain personnel information is excluded from public records. Safety, emergency response plans for schools. There, there are lots of things that are not included in public records that lawyers will fight about. But for your purposes, when you sit down and you write something and you work on something, you should assume from the very beginning that it's a public record. All right, next slide. So if everything you do is a public record, who do you have to share it with? The answer is everybody. Everybody everywhere can request your records. They don't have to be North Carolina citizens. They don't have to tell you why they want it. They don't have to do anything but ask for it in a reasonably detailed manner so it can be produced. That's all that they're required to do. And then you are responsible for producing it in a reasonable time. Now, when you produce your records, we don't just turn them over to uh, the requester. We do look through them and see if there are attorney-client privilege materials or anything, student records, anything like that. Uh, but you don't need to know all those details. You should not be withholding records because you've decided it's not a public record. When we ask for public records, you should give us everything you've got and let us decide what is a public record or not a public record. Unless, of course, it's your personal medical information or a communication with your own lawyer or something along those lines. But then you should still tell us that you've got those so we can ask the necessary questions. Um, so so you, can't, you cannot refuse to produce them because the person hasn't told you what they want them for or, or where they live or anything. We've got to produce the public records, and they have to produce them in a reasonable time. Reasonable time depends upon how many, how many requests you have. I mean, uh, agencies do keep records of public records requests and tell people where they are responding to them. Uh, but when you get a request for your public records, you should uh, pay attention to it. Give it attention. We are an electronic age, you don't generally have to go back to your file cabinet and start rifling through your manila folders and your files and find paper and stick it in a copy machine and make a copy of it and all that. When we ask for public records, go to your phone. Do you have any text messages about the subject? Go to your private emails. Do you have any emails about the subject? Have you posted something on Facebook about it? Uh, those are the kind of things that you're asked to do. Because generally speaking, all of your real business is kept on DPI and state board computers. And we have access to those and we'll pull that stuff up. Generally speaking, when we ask you to produce a public record, we're asking you to look at your private devices that we don't have access to. Uh, so that's what we're asking for there. Uh, I wanted to say something about your devices. Uh, 
A public record is determined by the content of the communication and the recording, not its location. So it doesn't matter whether the information is contained on your private cell phone or not. If it deals with charter school business, it is a public record and you have the obligation to produce it. Um, so I want to skip down to the bottom one, creating records. I've already told you that everything you do that creates a record, you've got to consider that a public record. You've got to assume it's a public record. Commingling of public and non-public records. For example, if you have a record that has information in it, but also has information about a particular student, the law requires us to redact the personally identifiable information, but produce the record. So you cannot immunize a document from public disclosure simply by commingling private information in the larger document. So you would have to go back, or we will have to go back in any document and excise information that is exempted from public records, but produce the redacted document. Uh, there have been some big cases about all this. Uh, you might recall that when UNC Chapel Hill was being investigated by the NCAA uh, about the uh, courses that some of the athletes were taking. Uh, there was a huge public records request by, made by a consortium of newspapers and televisions and radio. And uh, they reviewed millions of documents. And in the course of reviewing it, they went through all those documents and redacted the individual student names, redacted personally identifiable information but they produce the underlying document. Uh, and so commingling is uh, no reason not to produce the document. Verbal communication, verbal information, verbal information, if it's not recorded, if it's not a voicemail or, or an audio note, verbal information is not a public record because it can't be recovered by somebody else in order to determine what you said. It's just a transitory ephemeral act speaking, which gets me to one of my rules of thumb is that if it's a sensitive matter, pick up the phone and call. You don't have to write everything down. You don't have to text somebody. You can call somebody. It's you're not creating a public record when you call someone. Now, the fact that you called someone, the fact that you called me, would be a public record. But there wouldn't be any way of recovering the, the conversation. And so it's not, a, the, the contents of the call are not a public record. We would have to produce the law that you called me and we talked for an hour and a half but we wouldn't have to produce anything about the content of the conversation. So picking up the phone, the phone is a wonderful instrument, especially when talking to lawyers. Pick up the phone and call. You don't have to create a public record just to seek advice. All right, next slide. Uh, when you do get a public records request, please forward it to the DPI communications the state board and me, uh, will send them to uh, appropriate staff members. And we have people that, as I said, will go through the electronic communications, the files, the emails, and pull them out using uh, you know, critical term searches. And things. But your obligation, again, will be to re review your personal devices, your personal computer, your tablets, your iPhones, well, I don't think anyone has recorded voicemail on their tape players at home anymore. Uh, but we need to have your personal communication uh, off your devices if they are public record. And then do the same thing, download them to some format and uh, send them to the person that's requesting. And that will be the most common 
involvement you have with public records. It's, it's recovering information on your personal devices because the fact that it's on your personal device doesn't mean it's not a public record. It's a public record if it's recorded and it deals with charter school business. All right, next slide. What, what can happen if we are not responsive? Uh, the requesting party can run to court and get a court order to require the release of the information. Uh, and you can also, in that action, have to pay the attorney's fees if the information was unreasonably withheld. Uh, so it can cost you money. Uh, so, what do you need to know about public records? You need to know that everything is a public record and act accordingly. Don't ever assume that something you're doing is not a public record. Because even if you think it's about students, and you have student information in it, you'll discover that you have to produce the record without the student's name. So the exceptions are very narrow, and the exceptions are strictly enforced. If, it's, if there's not an exception in the statutes for it, then it's not an exception. So your drafts of public records. So when you open up your laptop and start writing something about charter schools, you need to assume that what you're doing is a public record and someone else will have the opportunity to read it. Which, again, is the only reason you're writing it in the first place. All right. Uh, do we want, Ashley, do you want to take questions? Do you want to wait till the end? Or are we set up to take questions? Are you set up to take questions? Totally up to you. Well, let's get through the material first, and people uh -huh. keep notes, and then we'll take questions at the end, because if there aren't any questions, then you'll all get to go home early. Uh, so go to open meetings. Open meetings. Open meetings are very complex. There's a lot of issues about open meetings. But in the five-minute university, what do you need to know about an open meeting? You need to know that you're not subject to open meetings if you don't have a majority of people present on the board. So you need to know that if there's not a majority of the board present, it is not an open meeting. If there is a majority of the board meeting, it is very, very likely an open meeting. So all the rest of the detail, you can forget. What you need to do is count noses. When you get to a quorum, you've got an open meeting. And then you have to you have to have noticed it and comply with the open meetings laws. Uh, but those things are not things that you should have to personally worry about. That's what Ashley and I and other people, staff support you, get paid the big bucks for. Uh, so remember, when you look around a room, if you've got a quorum for the Charter School Advisory Board, then you're in an open meeting. All right, so let me give you some detail about that. Uh, you are a public body. You are authorized to provide advisory advice to the state board. Therefore, you are a body of subject to open meeting. Don't even think about it. All right, next slide. There are other examples in DPI, the textbook commission, and, and the Perhaps it goes, but all you need to worry about is yourself. You are a public body subject to open meeting. Next slide. This is, this is the answer to the test question. A majority of members, that's all you have to think about. Either a majority of people present, because this long list of things, legislation, policy making, quasi-judicial, administrative, all those legal terms, don't worry about it because you are advisor. And the only reason you're meeting is to provide advice to the state board. And since you are an advisory board, you are subject to open meeting. It does not matter when you get together, how you get together, where you get together. If you, and the COVID, the COVID has shown 
all of this to be true. I trust you haven't met physically with a majority of the board for months, and yet you've had any number of open meetings. Same thing with telephone conference calls. Whether they're set up officially, or you do them from home on your cell phone. If you've got a majority of people simultaneously communicating in a medium of some type, you are in an open meeting, you are in an official meeting and you have to comply with open meeting. Next slide. What are the requirements of open meetings? Primarily public notice. You have to tell people that the, 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 your board is meeting. You have to tell them what you're gonna do. You have to give them a time and a date and location so that they can attend and listen to what you're doing. Uh, but again, staff, should be taking care of all this for you once you decide when you're going to. Uh, the amount of notice depends upon, you know, you should be publishing your regular calendar. If you're meeting every month, you have a calendar of monthly meetings that don't need to be noticed but once a year. But if you call emergency or special meetings, there's a certain time period. I think the minimum time period is 48 hours. Uh, but, uh, but you have to give notice so people can appear and listen and, and watch if they can uh, what do you have to do during the meeting you have to have written minutes you have to keep detailed minutes of the subject the motion the, dis the second the discussion the vote uh, most all of this stuff now is done by recording which is a public record uh, so you have to publish, you're going to have a meeting, you have to tell them why you're having a meeting, and then while you're at the meeting, you have to keep minutes. That's basically the obligations of, uh, in order to comply with the public meetings law. But again, that's not what you have to be worrying about. You just make sure that your staff is authorized or directed to do these things. What's the next slide, Ash? Now, we're slipping over into ethics. Uh, so, uh, At the beginning of your meeting, you are obligated to read this statement. And you hear it again and again and again, and I'm not gonna read it to you, but you are obligated to read the ethics statement and everyone's obligated to disclose their conflicts uh, at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, and I trust you're all familiar with this and do it on a regular basis. Uh, and if you do, you you're in compliance with this aspect of open. This is one thing that you must do. You can't, you can't delegate this to the staff. All right, next slide. Closed session. There is a list of things you can do in closed session, uh, but you shouldn't do that without consulting with staff or council. Uh, closed sessions can be uh, very particular. Depends upon how you arrange your closed session, what you're going to discuss in the closed session, and how you discuss it. Uh, but one of the procedural requirements is before you can have a closed session, you have to have a regular session, right? You have to be, you have to meet as a public body, and then go into closed session, and then you have to come out of closed session, reconvene the open session, and then adjourn. So there are procedural requirements for complying with the closed session. Uh, this has been a problem or an issue, I won't say a problem, it's been an issue whenever you're doing sensitive things, for example, why while doing personnel searches and you want to hold uh, an interview with someone if you're considering the appointment of someone and you want to keep the, the identity of the candidates confidential. Uh, you still have to meet in open session and say that your purpose is to meet with candidates. And then, of course, if the newspapers are interested in it, they will stake out the meeting room and see who shows up. And that was has always been a big issue in uh, large, you know, major appointments to large government bodies like the Board of Governors, constituent institutions, selecting chancellors or presidents. Uh, and it's, it's 
it's difficult. But uh, before you go into closed session, you have to have an official meeting, you have to have a motion to go into closed session, which is particular. The motion to go into closed session has to identify the particular reasons to go into closed session. And then it has to be a motion. You can go into closed session, primarily the most closed sessions are for attorney-client privilege. Uh, another one is to discuss uh, confidential records if they're coming from charter schools. You can, you can go into closed session to preserve the confidentiality of records to be discussed in the closed session. Uh, before entering into contracts, you can go into closed session to discuss some contract materials. And then uh, another big exception is to discuss personnel matters. Discussing personnel matters, though, has, an, has a, a limitation. You can go into closed session to discuss personnel matters, but you cannot go into closed session to discuss matters related to your own members. So if you have a dispute on your board where board members are not getting along, and you feel like you need to address that, uh, you cannot go into closed session to discuss the qualifications of your own board members. Nor can you go into closed session to discuss the qualifications and conduct of other public bodies. It's only employees, it's only personnel that you can discuss. You cannot discuss your own board or other boards in closed session. And even if it is a personnel matter, if you were hiring people, uh, if you were to make a recommendation, well, let me strike that. You can discuss personnel matters in closed session, but final decisions regarding personnel, for example, hiring someone or firing someone or promoting someone or assigning them new duties. If you are in the business of doing that, you can discuss it in closed session, but you have to take action in open session. And I don't know that you do any of that. I don't know that you do hire them, but that's, that's a, a, a trick to closed sessions that you can discuss, but you cannot take action on personnel matters. All right. What you need to know is that for attorney-client, you can have closed session discussions for attorney-client privilege, and you can maintain confidentiality of student records. Those are things that you are more likely to do uh, than personnel. All right, next one. What happens if uh, you violate open meeting? You can be enjoined to hold an open meeting. You can be stopped from having a, a meeting that doesn't meet the requirements of a closed session, say. And you run the risk of having your action invalidated. And you'd have to go back and redo it in an open session. Uh, there's a lot going on in open meetings, the, the exceptions, but you need to remember that if you have a majority of people together, you most likely have an open meeting. There is an exception for social, purely social activities. This is in the holiday season. If you gather together with a majority of the board members at someone's house, well, that would be a violation of some executive order, I'm sure. But, uh, but purely social meetings are not subject to open meetings because you're not supposed to be doing state business. Uh, so you can have you can have uh, a meeting like that. Uh, also, if say for if a, if a majority of your board were at a conference about charter schools, that would be an open meeting because you would not be there to conduct state business. You would be meeting for other purposes, uh, and you wouldn't be making decisions. Well, for the most part, if you've got a majority of your board present, you need to be thinking that. This is an open meeting. We have to notice this, or we have we, we can't discuss state business. All right, next slide. Uh, good online resources. Uh, you can look up a lot about open meetings. You can look up a, a lot about public records. Uh, there's a lot been written about it. Uh, next slide. These two works by David Lawrence are classics. Uh, they're thin volumes. It's worth keeping them. But, but they are not included in your five-minute university tuition. So you'll have to call your parents and ask them to send money to buy them for yourself. Uh, but they're worth having. Almost 
all the lawyers who work with public bodies have these these books. And so do all the reporters, by the way. So uh, worth reading if you're interested in all the details. But what you have to remember about public records is everything is a public record. And about open meetings, a majority of people present constitutes an open meeting. Those are the things you've got to remember. If those things are happening, then you talk to staff or your lawyers about it. Don't, don't try to be making your own decisions. All right, next slide. Now, ethics and conduct are things that you have to be responsible yourself. Uh, but we'll also get to uh, the role of the attorneys and other people in this area as well. Uh, so uh, these policies, go to the next slide, Ash. These policies uh, are all state board policies. It's my opinion at present uh, that you're not subject to the State Ethics Commission because you are purely an advisory board. Uh, I don't know that there's anything that you do that is a final decision. Uh, the statute that creates you is a, a statute that says you make recommendations, uh, and advisory boards are not subject to the statewide uh, board ethics requirements. But you are subject to state board policy, which is listed here. And you should be familiar with state board policy. And that's what uh, this presentation is about. Uh, so let's switch over to uh, state board policy. I can't believe Stephen's not here to hear you say that. Because <laughs> he's been saying that for seven years. What's that? That we're not subject to the Ethics Act because we're only an advisory board. But well, we've been told multiple times that we are. Uh, so who told you you were? I think, I mean, Dave would remember, right? Someone else who's been around chime in here, right? Has it well, the General saying? Assembly requires that we take the course. Does it, have, have you been to If you're appointed, okay, so yes. I was going to say, yeah. I take the ethics yeah. training every year. Every yeah. year. Two. Or every two. And why? Every why two years. All right, slow down. Who says, who, who told you you had to take it? We get an email saying you have to go take this course, and I, I didn't do it, and I got an email saying if I didn't get it done, they were going to find me. And the persons who uh, appointed me said it was required, and they also send just a uh, verification to the General Assembly. Yeah, well, they do that. Let me, let me look into that. Because Stephen has said that for on, seven years. For seven years, he said, I do not know why we we're subject to the Ethics Act and we are only an advisory board. And so, as a, let me chime in here. This is Joel Ford. As a former legislator, I agree with Stephen. And this is an advisory board. We don't set or make policy, right? We, we don't have the ultimate authority. So, why is the General Assembly requiring it? I think that is a misunderstanding. And that if the mm. attorney can send over an interpretation of it, we should be rid of this and get it updated. <laughs> two things, two things. All right, several things about that. It's the ethics commission that decides that you're subject. They have to decide that you're subject. Unless you're listed in a statute as being subject, which I'm not aware of. And you are advisory, but there is that provision in the statute that says you do other duties as assigned by the state board. And that, you know, I, I don't know everything that you've been asked to do by the state board, but it is possible that they have delegated to you some authority. Uh, and there are always questions, you know, as, for example, the one thing that's always gone round and round charter schools is, what is a complete application? And do you make a final decision about what a complete application is? And is that enough to trigger the ethics requirement? But since I, I, I hear now that this is a hot subject for you all, I will contact the Ethics Commission and ask them. Uh, now, having said that, the fact that you might be exempt doesn't mean you shouldn't take the training. It's good training. Uh, it's only three hours. Uh, and it keeps you sensitive to these issues, uh, which are important issues, whether you're required to do it or not. You know, need them. Uh, it might be a good idea. But of course, you shouldn't be sanctioned. If you're not required, you shouldn't be sanctioned for not 
let me make a note and I will ask the ethics commission whether you are subject or not. But uh, to my knowledge, as everyone has said, you're an advisory board. And advisory boards are not subject to the ethics. The ethics obligation of boards. Uh, that's my understanding of reading the statute. But uh, let me make a note and ask, and I'll get back to you with that. Thank you very much. Not that I think appreciate, it. Different, I appreciate it. Not that I expect to get a different decision, you understand, but I, I will ask. And I'll ask them why they think that. Uh, making a note. Okay. Uh, but these are things you are required to do, and that is comply with the State Board of Education policy. Uh, and those policies require you to comply with the applicable laws, which might be the ethics laws and rules and regulations. Uh, again, don't get caught up in this. Uh, all right, I was going to tell you what the five-minute university rule is for ethics. If you don't want to read about it in a newspaper, ask. If you, feel, if, if you don't want to read about what you did in this paper, make sure you ask. And then it can be explored and a decision can be made. Because conflicts of interest and these ethics are highly, highly factual. Uh, and it would be really useful if you have questions and you feel uneasy to talk about it with somebody else like me or, or seek advice and get an opinion that you can then say, I sought advice. And seeking advice in this area is value. It's a, it's a good thing to do. Uh, so seek counsel if you have any questions at all. That's what we're here for, is to, to listen to your issues, understand the facts, do the research, and get back to you. Otherwise, if you read about it in a newspaper, it's a bad thing. You don't want to do that. All right. Uh, you also have a fiduciary obligation to the board to the, and, and uh, to the charter school advisory board and the state board. That means fiduciary means you have to put your personal interest second to the interest of the board. Uh, so that's all. Fidu fiduciary means that you have to act in someone else's interest. You cannot act in your own interest. Okay, Ashley, next slide. Uh, you can't use a position for financial gain, whether direct or indirect. Indirect is one of those words that's subject to you know, a wide variety of interpretations for yourself or your family. Uh, indirect financial gain is sometimes difficult to measure. That's why if you feel uneasy, uh, you should ask. You know, indirect financial gain might be that you are going to make a decision on a matter that you don't have a financial interest in, but an outside client of yours has a financial interest in, and they might smile on you and bring you more business in the future if you were to rule in their favor. Uh, that kind of thing. Uh, Under the board policy, actual conflicts of interest are prohibited. Now, the conflict of interest itself is prohibited, right? So it doesn't matter whether you use the conflict of interest for the benefit of, of the organization or not. And this happens with, you can see this happen in charter schools applications. I don't know what you see now, but I remember when I was more involved in charter schools, you would have people who wanted to open charter schools. And the executive director of the charter school would own a building. And they would say, I would like the charter school to be in the building. And I'm willing to let them use my building for a dollar a year. That is a conflict of interest. You have an ownership in a building that you're leasing to the organization that you have fiduciary interest in. The fact that it's to their advantage doesn't mean it's any less than a conflict, any less of a conflict of interest. It just means that the conflict is working in favor of the public body. 
But the policy prohibits the conflict of interest, whether it is in favor of the public body or not. So in other words, you can't use your position to help the public body any more than you can use your position to hurt the public body. You're just not supposed to be involved in decisions that involve your personal interest. Also, the state board policy prohibits you from engaging in circumstances that create the appearance of a conflict of interest. They're supposed to be avoided. And appearances of conflict of interest are difficult because lots of times what people think is based upon an incomplete knowledge of the facts. And if they had the full facts, they would not think that way. But sometimes they would think that way irrespective. Uh, so uh, appearances of conflict of interest are difficult. I, I appeared before the state board and state board of state bar uh, of, for lawyers and complained about their use of appearance of conflicts of interest because they ought to be concerned about reality, it's not appearances. Nonetheless, nonetheless, your obligation is to avoid the appearance. And again, if you think there's an appearance, call, seek advice, get someone else to talk to you about it. And in the end, if you don't want to read it in the newspaper, don't do it, no matter how innocent it might seem. All right, next slide. Uh, the board is nonpartisan as a whole. You don't support public entities. Of course, there, you have a First Amendment right to engage in your own political activities, but you cannot, as a board, do anything political. Uh, what do you do with uh, a conflict? If you have a conflict, you report it, you recuse yourself from the discussion, and you report it. You report that I've got a conflict of interest, you withdraw from the discussion, and you get reported in the minutes that you withdrew. And you cover yourself and you insulate yourself from the discussion. There are different ways to apply conflicts of interest. Some conflicts of interest prohibit you from participating in the vote. The better practice is to, is to avoid the vote, avoid the discussion, and perhaps not even be present for the discussion. If that can be made, you can absent yourself from the meeting during a discussion of something in which you have a conflict, it's best to do that. Just because once you decide there's a conflict, you shouldn't be involved, and you don't want anyone to look like you've been involved, so just withdraw. It's the easiest thing to do. Next slide. Tom, Joe Mamoni put uh, the statute in the uh, chat box if you want to look at it. Is it a statute that actually... Uh, that I don't know if the statute says covered board, advisory board shall be treated as a board for purposes of chapter 138A of the general statutes. And then, in addition to ethics training, we are required to complete an economic statement. Okay, so that's... You know, the, the economic statement is separate. That's a different obligation. Advisory board treated as a board for purposes of chapter one, 115C218. Ah. Ah, so you did get a special piece of legislation. Let me see. One one two eighteen, which is your creating statute. Covered board, the advisory board. Okay, I'll find if obviously if it says it in the statute, you're subject. Nothing I can say will change that. I just wasn't aware there was a specific statutory obligation for this board because typically advisory boards are not included uh, in the ethics obligation. Uh, but I will look at that uh, and also, well, anyway, okay, good. I mean, if that's in the statute, you are subject and it's clear and you've got to do it. And as I said before, it doesn't hurt to do it anyway. It's good. It's good to know what your ethical obligations are because as I said, the idea is to avoid appearing in the newspaper, right? It's not good for anybody to have a controversy about whether you're acting in the public interest. And the more sensitive you are to that, the more likely you are to avoid problems. Oh, there it is, right there. Number three, the advisory board shall be treated as a board for purposes of Chapter 138A of the general statutes. Hmm. Oh, look at that. 
just because you were bored doesn't mean you're subject to the ethics. I'll, I'll have to study that further. See, that's the kind of thing you should bring to your attorneys and let them study it. All right, we'll move on. Uh, if you violate the conflicts of interest policy, you can be suspended from the board. Uh, and if you violate it really badly, if you take if you take money in exchange for your vote on something, you could be subject to criminal violation. Uh, but again, you don't want you don't embarrass yourself or other members of the board by doing something that people are going to bring to light and raise questions about your decisions. Lord knows, I know enough about your work. I've been involved in enough about your work to know that it's highly public that people are very interested in what you do and you really need to be sure that everyone believes that although they might not agree with your decision and, and they will disagree as you know you don't want them thinking they disagreed with it you disagreed with the decision or you took a decision because you had a personal interest you know it's it's this is just business and that's what you want to keep it You know, so your standards of conduct apply to the Charter School Advisory Board. Next slide. Uh, the, the, the policy requires you to adhere to the standards, highest standards of personal integrity, truthfulness, and honesty. Uh, avoid any action that appear to be in conflict, and always act for the best interest of the children. Uh, and those should be your personal standards when you're on the board. Uh, again, if there are any questions, all it has. Next slide. Oh. Okay, so this is like bribery, right? Don't accept or solicit anything of value uh, or any promise of favor uh, or, or do anything where there's an expectation of, of to be paid for it uh, with anybody who has any business before you, right? I mean, this, this is the easy part. Don't go around doing things for people that appear before you in exchange for anything of value. Not difficult. Next slide. You know, there are exceptions. Uh, you can accept honors and awards. And you can, if you get approved secondary employment, you can be approved and if someone's giving you a gift Christmas time someone's giving you a gift because they're a friend of you or your family you can accept the gift uh, but uh, you can't you can't accept gifts uh, in exchange for your vote or support or opposition to a position uh, and gifts is pretty broad uh, you know if you go to, you know, it's just best not to take things from people. Just best not to accept gifts if it's related to your role on the Charter School Advisory Board. If it's even if they're your even if they're your friends, you might say, you know what, this doesn't. I, I just don't want to do this. Let's not raise this issue. Let's 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 keep this purely business because you don't want to read about it in this paper. All right, next one. Right now, when you travel for business to a conference, if you're getting lodgings from organizations who support improving education, then you can take them. But you can't take them from people that are selling things to DPI or you. So if, so if a professional organization is sponsoring you to promote education, that's one thing. But if a business, if, if uh, an education management organization is sponsoring it because they have business, you can't. Uh, again, these are the kind of questions that if something comes up, call and talk about it and get an opinion. Don't, don't be out there on your own because, again, you don't want to read about it in the newspaper. All right, next one. I'm the interim general counsel, so until January 1st, you can call me. Uh, you can get advisory opinions from the ethics commissions, uh, and there are, of course, other statutes that govern this behavior. Uh, 
But again, don't get bogged down in the details. That's what you hire staff and lawyers to do. You have to identify the issue. You know what's happening. If you feel uncomfortable about it, call, and we'll talk about it. Uh, and then we'll make a decision and uh, you can go forward from there knowing that you fulfilled your obligation, which is a very important part of public service, knowing that you did the right thing. Okay, and that's slide 34, and I finished three minutes early. Uh, so I'm going to look up the statute. That's something. Uh, and and uh, so covering the public body, what is a public body? I was talking about majority. You've got to remember that majority also covers committees. So if, if your board creates a committee, that's a public body. And if your committee creates a subcommittee, that's a public body. So one of the ways to comply with open meetings and yet be efficient and effective is that if you have uh, three members of all your committees, you can at least have a personal conversation with one of them. Well, no, you can't, because that's two out of three. You gotta have five members before two people can talk together. So all your subcommittees are, op are subject to open meetings because they're a board. Uh, they're a, they're a group of more than two people. In order to be a public body, you have to be more than two people engaged in advisory activity. So all your subcommittees are going to be subject to open meetings just like the board is. Uh, anytime you have a majority, it's an open meeting. Uh, Answered that question, and you do. You are required to complete the uh, statement of economic interest, uh, and that is statutory. Uh, so, any other questions? Again, everything's a public record. Majority for public for open meetings. Don't read about it in the newspaper for ethics. If you're thinking about those three things, you can comply with all your obligations. Let the lawyers and the staff worry about the details. Your job is to be sensitive to the issues and bring it to our attention, and then let us work it out. All right. You can ring the bell and everyone can go home unless you had a question. <laughs> Nobody, quick, nobody ask a question. <laughs> Move to adjourn. <laughs> Dog got inside 10 of them. <laughs> I'll second your motion, Alex. All right. <laughs> Tom, that was great. Thank you. We appreciate it. Very good. And I will talk, yeah. to, the ethics, I will talk to the ethics people about that. And, and talk to you. And you're pretty funny for a lawyer, so well done. Yeah, well, it's, it's, uh, it's, you got to laugh through the pain. Thank you all. all right. Go out all in favor. Do good. Do good. All right. So tomorrow, we'll pick it back up at 9 a.m. tomorrow, y'all. See you in the morning. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks to CS staff for everything. Goodbye. And shout out to Ashley for that great uh, compilation and video. I know that's frustrating. That stuff can be hard to put together. So thanks. You're doing well. Lawrence, if you can hear me, um, we can shut off streaming. I will also text you. <laughs>